Mario Kart is the best-selling racing game of all time for a reason. It's easy to pick up, it's a lot of fun, and it's kept the same bulletproof formula for over 20 years, with only minor tweaks that don't rock the boat. Unfortunately, due to Mario Kart being so dominant for so long, the state of kart racing nowadays is a bit stagnant. If you're not an open-world mission-based game, you're either Mario Kart or you're a Mario Kart clone. Games don't want to stray too far from that perfected Mario Kart formula. But if the game is going to be so similar to Mario Kart, well then, let's just play Mario Kart. It's a shame, because back when the 3D kart racing genre was still new, developers were more willing to experiment with unique systems, and consumers were more willing to take risks with different kart racers. One such game was the original LEGO Racers, developed by High Voltage Software in 1999. The gameplay systems in this game, like its unique shortcut and item systems, have never been reproduced in any other game, including its own sequels. And unfortunately, they never will. Let's see what's so unique and awesome about this Abandonware game, where it all went wrong, and why it'll stay abandoned. So, cart item systems. Generally, in kart racers, if there are items on the track, they'll either be random, like in Mario Kart, or predetermined, like Diddy Kong Racing, or TKR for the sake of brevity. Both systems have pros and cons. Mario Kart's system has the advantage of being able to provide a dynamic handicap to players. If you're in the lead, you'll get weaker power-ups, whereas if you're behind, you'll get insanely overpowered ones designed to get you back in the game. Diddy Kong Racing's predetermined items do away with the handicap and give everyone a level playing field, which is not necessarily good or bad, but it is different. When you pick up a red balloon, you'll always get a missile. When you pick up a blue, you'll always get a boost, and so on. Because the power-ups stay the same regardless of what position you are in the race, DKR is not beginner-friendly. But it has some deeper strategies that Mario Kart can't. For example, if you're given a choice between a boost and a shield, you'd probably choose the boost, if you're not near any other cars. But if you're barely in front of the pack, you could get hit at any moment by someone behind you, knocking you out of the boost. So you might consider taking the shield instead. Furthermore, if you run over multiple balloons of the same color, you can upgrade your power-up. So a missile upgrades to a homing missile and then upgrades to a set of 10 missiles. So there's a second layer of strategy. If you've got max missiles and you see a boost, is it better to hold the missiles for a rainy day or throw them away for a short boost? Think about that. Well, LEGO Racers, which came out two years after Diddy Kong Racing, takes it a step further. Instead of upgrading with the same color, you've got these white bricks, which power up the base colored brick. Unlike DKR, whose upgrades are missile, 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 LEGO Racers has a cannonball, a grapple, a wand, and, okay, more missiles, but those in-between steps are, to me, what sets LEGO Racers apart. Each upgrade step has its own utility. The cannonball is a single target attack, the grapple is too, but it also gives you a speed boost. The wand doesn't have the speed boost, but it can hit multiple targets multiple times. And the missiles can only hit three targets, but they can hit targets that are far out of your range. Each of these power-ups can be useful depending on where you are in the pack. If you have a grapple and you see a white, sometimes it's better to just ignore it and use the grapple to pull ahead. Because each upgrade has different utility, the system is far deeper than other racing games. The power-up this game is remembered for, though, is, of course, the warp. The prophecy is true. Upgrading the green speed boost brick with three whites takes the game to another level. By warping, you can skip large parts of the map. It feels amazing to warp and go from lagging behind to well ahead. And the feeling of grabbing a white or a green on your way in or out of a warp to chain another warp is an unmatched feeling of momentum. It's like rushing down a treacherous mountain, bounding from rock to rock, knowing you could crack your skull open at any time. Despite how overpowered the warp may seem, and it is, there are some strategies when using it. See, by warping, you don't just skip over that part of the course, you skip over all those power-ups too. So there are times when it's better to use a weaker boost instead. On this map, there's only two green bricks on the entire course, and they're both at the end of the course very close to each other. So the first chance you have to warp is right here, but uh-oh, if you want to warp here, you'll have to skip over the only other green brick on the course. So it's actually in your best interest to have only two white bricks here, then activate your jets, scoop up the second green, and then warp. 
This makes the game a great candidate for speedrunning as well, because of the interesting routing possibilities, and the fact that CPUs might scoop up certain bricks you need, causing you to have to think on your toes and adjust your route. But just like how CPUs can screw you over, you can screw them over too. If you pick up a colored brick when you already have one, they'll swap. One way to exploit this is to collect a less useful brick, like a yellow, and then replace a green with that yellow. So not only do you get a boost, but you deny a boost for another player on that lap, often the boss. All of these little nuances in the power-up system combine for some really great moments. But I think the greatest use of these power-ups are when they work in tandem with the other great system of LEGO Racers, the Shortcut system. The shortcuts in LEGO Racers are some of the most memorable of any racing game I've ever played. Whenever I play another racing game, I'm always disappointed at how lame these shortcuts are. Like, take a look at some of these Mario Kart shortcuts. Little jumps like this are pretty much all Mario Kart has to offer. Actual shortcuts in Mario Kart are either extremely rare and require a mushroom to use, or were not intended by the developers and only possible due to some special circumstance like 200cc. If there was anything modern racing games should steal from LEGO Racers, it's the shortcut system. The shortcuts are extremely satisfying to use because they shave off so much time, and they're often accessed by secret passages or hidden gaps in the walls, which is fun to discover. The sheer creativity on display is fantastic. Here are just a few of the highlights. So on Amazon Adventure Alley, you can go through this waterfall at the start, which gives you an early white brick, setting you up for an immediate warp. On Desert Adventure Dragway, you can go through this early shortcut, or take a shortcut later down the road. Both shortcuts require an attack to open, and both let out at the same point. Although the first shortcut saves more distance, it has to be shot open every lap, whereas the second shortcut saves less time, but only needs to be shot once, making it superior if you're trying to keep green bricks. Magma Moon Marathon has two very unique shortcuts. For this one, you have to memorize a sequence of colored lights that appear at the end of the lap. Then, if you drive through those lights on the next lap, this door opens, giving you three whites. The other one is just as good. If a shield is activated here, you can pass through this wall. This one is great because it gives the shield additional utility beyond just defense. And alongside those creative shortcuts, you've still got your skill-based shortcuts like Dark Forest Dash, which requires you to make some tight turns to avoid bumping into several walls, negating the time gained. But the shortcut system isn't perfect. One of the biggest offenders is Ice Planet Pathway. This shortcut is so obvious and in your face, you'd think it was part of the course. Not only does this shortcut save an insane amount of time, but along the way, it gives you three whites and a green guaranteeing a warp, and making this race pretty much unlosable. Really, the shortcuts are at their best when it's a decision to use them. For example, on Imperial Grand Prix, most people will use the red here to bomb these barrels and get an easy shortcut through this wall. But by cutting through here, you're missing out on three whites, which would give you a free warp. If you already have the whites for some reason, the choice is obvious, but if you don't, the shortcut isn't the best option. So, I think you get the idea. LEGO Racers has amazing systems with insane potential, but I hear you say, well, if LEGO Racers is so great, why haven't we seen more games like it? And what's the deal with that clickbait title? I mean, surely they could make another game like LEGO Racers if they wanted to. Well, there's a lot of moving parts here. Let's first talk about why there will never be another LEGO game like LEGO Racers, and then let's talk about how the gaming industry as a whole has moved on from this type of gameplay. So if I told you to close your eyes and picture what a classic LEGO video game is, you'd probably give one of two answers depending on what decade you grew up in. There were the late 90s, early aughts LEGO games, and then there was the barrage of non-stop Traveler's Tales LEGO games. You know the ones. Star Wars, Harry Potter, Indiana Jones, The Hobbit, Pirates of the Caribbean? Wait a minute, they even made games for Marvel and DC? Now, let me be clear, these games are good games. I 100%ed the Star Wars one on my PSP back in the day, but it's undeniable that these games were very samey. Sure, there might have been some gameplay tweaks from entry to entry, just like how Madden 07 is different from Madden 08, but compared to these early LEGO games, they're undeniably very similar. But there was one benefit to this. You knew what you were getting. If you were a fan of these games, you could buy the next one confident that it would scratch that itch. Fans of the early LEGO games 
cannot say the same for that era. LEGO Racers 1 was a completely different game from LEGO Racers 2. LEGO Island 1 was completely different from 2, and so on. Although the variety of games was interesting, it was a huge disappointment to those of us who were fans of those first entries and wanted an improved version of the same game. Give us new tracks, new characters, nerf the green brick, but keep the same basic gameplay. That's all we wanted. LEGO Racers 2 was a decent game, and I have fond memories of it, but it was essentially a completely new franchise. It had Mario Kart-style random power-ups, no notable shortcuts, and it was an open-world-style game like Forza Horizon or Burnout Paradise. The power-ups in particular were pretty uninspired compared to the first LEGO Racers. And as I said in the opening, if you're gonna try to copy Mario Kart, then <laughs> let's just play Mario Kart. What went so horribly wrong? Well, the answer lies with the developers. As I just mentioned, the Traveler's Tales LEGO games, you know, they always had a consistent voice. Now, let's look at the teams who developed the older LEGO games. We've got Mindscape, Chrysalis Software, Superscape, Ivanov, Data Design Interactive, iVoltage Software, Stormfront Studios, Digital Domain, Intelligent Games, Silicon Dreams, Attention to Detail, Sapphire Corporation. I mean, do you see a pattern forming here? Yeah, every game from this era was made by a different developer, and therefore each game had a different voice and vision. As kids, we didn't know anything about game development, we just got our copy of LEGO Magazine in the mail, kind of on the thin side, isn't it? Saw that there was a new game coming, and mailed in our hard-earned lemonade stand money to get it. But when we inserted the disc and started playing, we could tell that something wasn't right. Did any of these developers do an inherently bad job? Certainly not, and it's actually pretty impressive that so many of these games are looked fondly upon despite having completely different developers every time. But the fact is, there's no cohesion here. Every game starts from scratch, barely anything is carried over to the next game, and if it is, it feels like a stranger wearing the face of someone you knew. I just ate one of your fine, fine, super fine pizzas in ten minutes. That means I could eat six in an hour, and if I ate all day, I could finish about 72 of them. And that would be about 504 pizzas in a week. Whoa, it is cool, but I bet I can make it look even cooler. In the case of LEGO Racers, it genuinely feels like there was absolutely no communication between High Voltage and the new dev team, Attention to Detail. The new team basically made the game they wanted to make, with no regard for what worked in the previous game. And hey, I'm not mad at them for doing what they want, and again, I think LEGO Racers 2 is decent. But it really shouldn't have been called LEGO Racers 2. Maybe something like LEGO 1K Drive would have been a more fitting title. But anyway, enough. That was then, this is now. What's stopping them from making a true sequel to LEGO Racers now? Well, the critical component to LEGO Racers' success wasn't just the gameplay. It was the characters. Redbeard, Kahuka, Basil the Batlord, Johnny Thunder, Baron Von Baron, Gypsy Moth, and all their minions and rivals were part of actual LEGO sets that you could buy. I can't stress enough how important this was to the success of the game. LEGO Racers was basically the Super Smash Bros of LEGO. I remember Johnny Thunder in particular, I had so many of those adventure sets. And one of the coolest parts about LEGO Racers was driving through the courses and actually seeing those sets that you built as part of the course. Like, look at this. Or this bit here. Uh, like, they really did a fantastic job making this stuff come to life. I remember a friend of mine actually had the Basil sets before they had been discontinued, and I was so jealous because I thought he was the coolest character ever. I would have done anything to get my hands on that bad helmet. Anything. And who could forget about Rocket Racer? He was the only character in the group that wasn't from a LEGO set, so he really felt like an unknown anomaly. Characters like Gypsy Moth with her vertical eyelids were pretty intimidating, but this guy... They do a great job of establishing him as a real threat, with only half a minute of screen time. Seriously, he feels like on the same level as, like, Gary from Pokemon or something. <laughs> anyway, that's neither here nor is it there. Rocket Racer and Veronica Voltage are outliers. They're clearly interdimensional beings looking to race people. 
The vast majority of the cast think Smash Bros. So why can't they do something like this now? Well, if you've been in the Lego aisle of a toy store in the last 10 years, you already know why. Modern Lego just doesn't have the set themes to carry a Smash Bros type game like this. I mean, sure, they have Harry Potter and Avengers and Mario, but that's not really the same, is it? The only modern themes that fit the mold are the city theme, the friends theme, and the Ninjago theme. Not really much to choose from there. You can kind of feel the struggle that the developers went through when creating the new LEGO 2K Drive as pretty much the whole game was based on city sets or original characters. One of our rival characters is Baron Von Rose. He's a vampire. So if a LEGO Racers game was to ever go back to that Smash Bros feel, they'd have to either dig deep and dredge up old sets, which could be cool, or they would have to make a bunch of new themes that aren't based off of existing IP. Tell you what, I'll make a follow-up video in 2045 and we'll see how that goes. So yeah, things aren't looking great for LEGO to make a faithful sequel to the original LEGO Racers. But okay, what about some other company? Couldn't someone like a Sony, a Microsoft, or even a Nintendo put out a new kart racer? I mean, after all, Diddy Kong Racing had a lot of similar mechanics, so how about a new Diddy Kong Racing, but with mechanics taken from LEGO Racers, like the shortcut system and the warp? Well, that prospect doesn't look so great either. And the reason is quite simple. The mechanics of LEGO Racers, and I would also argue Diddy Kong Racing, were designed with single player in mind first and multiplayer in mind second. The vast majority of the effort was put into the single player campaign and the car building mechanics. The single player time trials with Veronica Voltage also have great care taken with them, with new power up locations specifically for that mode, turning it almost into a puzzle game. Meanwhile, the versus mode is grayed out by default and supports a maximum of two players, even on console. Two players for a kart racer is pretty much a joke. Every other racer of the time had four player support. Additionally, the gameplay itself, you know, all that stuff that I've been gushing about in this video, is built around single player. I mean, think about it, there are absolutely no comeback mechanics in the game, and in fact, the game favors the person who's in first. Once you're in the lead, it's very easy to continue warping and, and snowballing because there's no one to stop you by stealing your green and white bricks. It's not unusual for skilled players to lap most of the CPUs, and even lap the boss. I think the devs were aware of this and how much the gameplay is centered around the warp, but instead of nerfing the warp, they decided to let the player have fun and go all in on the mechanic. No better is this shown than in the final boss fight, where the entire track is littered with greens and whites. It's not uncommon for players to get six or seven warps in one race on this track. Even the shortcut on the track is a warp. Being super overpowered is great in a single player game, but in a multiplayer game, you'd have people in the back of the pack who would never want to play again. Imagine if LEGO Racers came out this year as is and had an online mode. It would be a completely unbalanced nightmare. You'd have one player at the front of the pack who gets the first green, pulls ahead, and then grabs momentum and warps farther and farther ahead until they start lapping other players. If they were going to build this game with multiplayer in mind, they'd have to have some sort of comeback mechanic. But that goes against the current power-up system where all power-ups are predetermined. Diddy Kong Racing has a similar problem with its power-up system. And guess what? That hasn't gotten a sequel either, despite being a beloved game. It's just not what publishers are interested in doing. I mean, come on. Imagine being in a pitch meeting at Sony. You're pitching a highly skilled, speedrun focused, single player first kart racer? <laughs> You'd get laughed out of the room. These companies would have no interest in a single player focused party game. Even if the gameplay is fantastic, multiplayer is the way. They need to sell microtransactions. They need to sell skins. They want to get multiple people buying the game so they can play each other. A single player focused power up system would never fly. Okay, so if the power ups aren't a good fit for multiplayer, what about the shortcuts? I mean, couldn't you make a modern multiplayer focused Lego Racers type game, but just nerf the warp and keep the shortcuts? It's possible, but not without major balance considerations. So imagine a course like Ice Planet Pathway, but with six person multiplayer. Every player would just take the shortcut. And if every player takes the shortcut, then, well, it's not a shortcut anymore, it's just the course. If humans are playing against each other, a meta will naturally develop, and if the meta involves taking a certain path, you better believe that every player will try to do it. 
So one way to balance towards multiplayer? Have the player make choices about the shortcuts. Maybe sometimes the shortcut is the best option, but not always. Situations like this, where the longer path has better power-ups, could be the way to go. Another way could be to have players pay some sort of resource to use the shortcut. An example of this already in the game is this shortcut I mentioned earlier where you have to pick up and spend a shield to get through. Let's try to apply this shortcut idea to another game like Mario Kart. As of right now, the only resource you can pay to use a shortcut is a mushroom. For example, you pay one mushroom here to access this shortcut. But taking a page out of LEGO Racer's playbook, other power-ups like shells could be used too. One of the DLC courses, Ninja Hideaway, has a secret passage here that kind of does this. This is one of the only LEGO Racers-like shortcuts out of 96 courses in the game. To open it up, all you have to do is crash your card into it, and as a penalty, you spin out for a moment. But you can also use a mushroom or a shell to avoid that penalty and just speed through. It would be cool if Mario Kart had other fake walls like this in the game that forced you to use a shell to get through, instead of having the shell be optional. Another resource players could use for shortcuts are the coins. If there was a shortcut that opened up to players with a lot of coins, then took some of those coins as payment, like a toll booth barrier or something, it could be another way to pay a resource for a shortcut. Even if we never get a true sequel to LEGO Racers, I would love to see more shortcuts like these in other games. If you'd love to see more videos like these, please subscribe. I'm a small, part-time creator who would love to have more time in the day to make videos. Liking, subscribing, and sharing helps me to do that. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on LEGO Racers and its systems in the comments. Lastly, I want to give a huge shout out to the folks in the LEGO Racers speedrunning Discord who helped me fact check this video. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.